Hey everyone. I don't know about you, but I'm ready for some coffee. My favorite spot uh, because of the people, because of the coffee beans, all the good stuff is Cafe 211 in Bentonville. If you're not in the Northwest Arkansas area though, Cafe 211 also offers their, um, their beans and their coffee mugs deliverable, I think nationwide. Um, so you can create that whole experience from your home. Mauricio Guerrero is the founder of Cafe 211. He is from Guatemala and his coffee is from Guatemala as well. There's a beautiful story that's tied to it. I encourage you to check out the Cafe 2 in 1 website. Check out Mauricio's story, the story of the coffee and the people who make it. And uh, go ahead and buy some and we can sip it together during our next conversation. And you can use the discount code CARAELVIRA10 to uh, get a 10% discount on your order. Good afternoon, Jen. I'm so happy you could be here today. Thanks so much for inviting me. I'm, I'm excited to chat. Absolutely. So I can't ignore the epic space that you're in right now. I feel like I'm in a science laboratory or like a ghost hunters. I don't even know how to describe it, but I'd love to. Maybe you could set the scene of, of where we're speaking today. Uh, sure. So this is my apartment in Oakland, California. Um, I have a little kind of corner of our industrial loft blocked off as my studio space. So this is my little sanctuary. Um, and I've got some mannequins back here with costumes that I've worked on. Uh, let's see, some different artwork, various different collections of items. It's like a glove mold back there. Uh, let's see, I've got a display cabinet over there with little bits and bobs like memorabilia from different projects. And of course, all my, my art books. So, and there's lots of tools out of frame just behind you. Oh my gosh, I love it. I think you're just living the, the coolest life there. And I'm so excited to uh, get to dive into what all you do. Um, for everyone who has not met you yet, this is Jen Schachter. She is a freelance artist, a small business owner, and a contributor on Tested, which is just like so interesting. Um, Jen, I would love to start with your background and kind of how you got into the space of making. Sure, yeah. Uh, so I guess, well, I could start at the beginning. Um, I've been I guess I've been a maker my whole life. I've been creating things like when I was really little, I was creating stuff for like my toys and, you know, building things, building worlds, building like furniture and outfits and stuff for them. And I got really into drawing and my parents were like, oh, cool, she's kind of good at this. So I went to some art classes uh, and it became pretty clear that that's what I wanted to do. So I, I went through high school and into college um, to pursue an art degree, which I got at um, Maryland Institute College of Art, which is a small art college in Baltimore. And I spent uh, most of my time there doing a variety of different things. I was kind of a, a gen of all trades, if you will. Uh, I studied a lot of fine art, a lot of sculpture. I did some video work as well, but I graduated from school not knowing totally what I wanted to do. So I was kind of bouncing around doing some different stuff. Uh, I did a little, a little stint in corporate America, uh, working for a company doing visual merchandising. So kind of figuring out the store layouts and like what the mannequins are wearing and how to communicate with the store fleet. And it was an interesting job because I learned a little bit about the retail world, but it was also useful to me in terms of learning visual communication. So how do you get a fleet of stores to replicate what you're doing in the, you know, in the corporate office to kind of follow those brand guidelines? Um, I, I realized after a year or so that the corporate life wasn't quite for me. So I started looking into nonprofit organizations and I found a job at a makerspace in Baltimore called Digital Harbor Foundation. And they are a youth makerspace that is kind of, it's a really cool community. Um, they work with kids from ages like five all the way up through high school and they teach them digital fabrication and coding and you know design skills. So I, I was sort of initiated into the, into the formal maker community while working at Digital Harbor Foundation. Uh, we went to our first maker fair, my first maker fair. Uh, we hosted a hackathon and I learned all about like 3D printing and laser cutting. And I, I think there was a moment when I was at Digital Harbor that I realized, oh, these are my people. This is where they are. Like it's not necessarily in the fine art realm, even though that's my background, like this maker kind of hands-on DIY teaching yourself um, community was where I really fit in. And from there, things sort of took off. Uh, I 
was commissioned to do a project with um, with Adam Savage for Tessa.com and that went really well and I've been working with them pretty much ever since. So oh my yeah, God. That's, the, that's the bird's eye view. <laughs> that was a beautiful way of tying it all together what's been like an epic um, journey. So thank you for doing that. I think your description of um, being a gen of all trades, it's so cool that that has been important in each part of your life um, and then having the bravery to, to do corporate, recognize it wasn't for you, but like take the learnings and see the value that it added rather than feeling like it was, um, you know, a waste of time um, is a really good um, outlook to have. I wonder too, you mentioned about finding your people in the maker space and recognizing that being different than the fine art community. Um, but I wonder if you could speak um, more specifically to like, what is different what is the difference between fine art and making because like painting is making too kind of like how do you how would you separate the two uh, I, I think there's a lot of overlap and definitely art is certainly a form of making um for me i feel like it has to do with the sort of community culture or, and what the the vibe of the people who are doing it is for me when i was in the kind of in the fine art realm it's a lot more like people who have a formal education, they are in galleries, they have like an agent who represents, I mean, that's like the goal, you're working towards like having this, um, you know, being able to, to create stuff in your studio. Mm -hmm. It can often be a solo practice, not always, there's certainly lots of artists that make collaborative work, but it is uh, generally, I would say it's a lot more people, you know, making a painting or making a sculpture or a piece of textile or something as a solo individual thing. Uh, so for me, when I found the makerspace and I found the people and the community that was part of that, it felt way more collaborative. There are obviously makers building things solo, but there is this community of sort of learning and teaching one another and sharing of skills that felt a lot more intrinsic to the maker community than it did to the, the fine art realm, so to speak. Uh, a lot of people who are building stuff, whether they're, you know, chefs or woodworkers or textile artists like they are a lot of times they have lots of elements of things that they've taught themselves or they've sort of hacked together a bunch of different skills uh, and I, I really like that I like that kind of um, exploration yeah I um, I think I would definitely love that that too and I think it's so um, it must feel so great to find your people and your community be like oh like this is what it feels like to be planted in a place where <laughs> people are thinking the same as me or, you know, um, have the same entrepreneurial sort of, of mindset or inventor sort of mindset. Mm -hmm. um, you also mentioned how your partnership with um, Tested started with like a commissioned project. And I wonder if you could give some background on what Tested is and also like how that commission came to be. Sure, yeah. Uh, so Tested is a media channel online. Uh, primarily it's a YouTube channel. And they host a number of different sort of shows and series that cover everything from building to science, tech, um, you know, things like 3D printing and laser cutting uh, and prop making all, all across the map, all different sorts of STEAM uh, interests. And they make content about this online. So they were asked to participate in a, a festival that was happening uh, in, let's see, 20. 2016, 2016, uh, during the Obama administration, the White House was hosting a festival uh, called South by South Lawn, which is a spinoff of South by Southwest, the oh. Austin Arts and Music Festival. And they wanted to have this event at the White House on the South Lawn and like bring a bunch of science and technology makers and educators and, um, you know, sort of change makers in the community. And they were looking for a piece, a, a an object to put at the centerpiece of the event to kind of be like a place where people could take pictures and interact with this thing. So they were trying to build a giant light up letter, like letters that said SXSL. And they reached out to Tested to participate in this. And I also got a phone call from my former boss at the makerspace and he's like hey I know you build stuff like I know you're working in an another makerspace like what are you doing right now do you want to do this project with Adam Savage and the deadline was really short it was kind of like what sure okay I'll figure out how to make it work uh so I fabricated these pieces of these huge like seven foot tall letters and we brought all the parts to 
Digital Harbor Foundation to the youth makerspace and all these kids and the staff and their parents got together and for a whole day we painted and assembled and wired up with lights these huge letters and brought them to the White House the next day and installed them on the lawn for this event. And it went really well. It was it was a hit. There's tons of pictures of people. Actually, let's see if I can show you. Yeah. Real quick. Um, I'm just gonna navigate to the page. Perfect. Um, um hang on one second. <laughs> All good. Here we go. So, so these are these are the letters on the White House lawn. Um, as you can see, they're they're pretty tall, and the colors inside the letters would change based on um, what people were interacting with. So there is a a Raspberry Pi pulling from the Twitter API, so folks could tweet using certain hashtags, and it would change the color of the letters in real time. So you could be standing in front of them, and the, the colors would change. Um, and yeah, it went really well. So we we have done a bunch of collaborations since then. Oh my gosh. So you were mentioning um, someone from one makerspace reached out to you at this other makerspace. What's a, a makerspace? Like in my head, I'm thinking oh, yeah. we work with a bunch of people, but it, uh, yeah, who is, who's in a makerspace? What does it take to be in a makerspace? Yeah. There's so many different kinds, which is really wonderful. Um, I guess if I had to describe it, it's a place that provides either tools or education about building stuff, usually both. So uh, it could be like a tool library where people are renting out tools to borrow to take home. Uh, oftentimes they have a lot of machine equipment like a table saw or a laser cutter or 3D printers or CNC machine. And if you're a member of that space, uh, sometimes there's a membership fee, sometimes it's open to a specific community, sometimes they're inside of educational institutions. and to participate in that space, there's different ones have different sort of membership models. Like some of them, there's more participatory elements. Some of them you can just stop by and use the 3D printer. Uh, but basically it's just a, a location, a, a community where there is access to the learning and the tools to, to build stuff. Uh, they're, yeah, they're all different places there. Sometimes a college will have one. Sometimes it'll be its own freestanding institution. Uh, so I was working at the youth makerspace and I also got involved with um, OpenWorks, which is another makerspace in Baltimore that's geared more towards um, adult makers and entrepreneurs, people that are um, building their business essentially at this space. So, Oh, that's yeah. so cool. Yeah, I um, maybe could have guessed that they would be at universities, but to know that these are freestanding places too is just uh, such a good insight um, and a fun way maybe if people are moving from city to city to get tapped into um, collaboration locally. I imagine um, you oh. also. Been, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just saying. Yeah, definitely. That's a like. It's there's this huge network in there, necessarily all under the same umbrella, but it's a very sort of sharing, connected community. So if you were moving to different places, you could totally get connected that way. So cool. You also mentioned for this project that you know there was children, there was parents, there was like a whole world involved in it. I feel like I've heard people say maybe to get something done quickly, do it yourself, but to get it done well, or like maybe in an innovative way, like bring in a lot of voices. But bringing in a lot of voices is not um, an easy task as I understand it or as I've experienced it. And so I wonder if you could speak to what that was like to have all these people working on this project with you. Sure, yeah. Um, I have some great pictures I can show of the yes. build. This is some of the, the chaos that was happening that day of people oh my gosh. painting and building. This is a group of a group of us standing together once the sign was finished. Um, yeah, so oh, working with large groups, it's so it's it's really challenging, but it's also one of the most exciting parts about making for me. Um, and again, what differentiated the solo art practice from this right. community collaborative build is really that element. Uh, it's a lot about organization and planning and communication, um, more of the kind of logistics side of things and knowing what needs to be done in advance so you can plan and anticipate for it. It's a lot of like, um, you know, putting together calendars and timelines and figuring out project milestones and communicating that out with your team and saying, okay, this is the team tasked to do this thing. This is when I need you to get this done by 
we're going to have this arriving at this time. We've got to have a team of people ready to receive this. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a very, I guess it's a, it's a project manager position in a lot of ways, um, integrated with making, because you also have to know what, what all the parts are and how all the material is going to behave and things like that. Oh, it sounds exciting. A little chaotic maybe at times, but, but super exciting. Um, so I, I love this as a, an entry point to talk about a few different types of builds that you've worked on. Like they span, so this was like a display and installation is how you describe it on your site, but we'll also look at a digital fabrication you've done and wood building and costumes and sculpture and, um, you know, mission control, a few different ones that we can, can scroll through today. But I, before we dive into the specifics, I wanted to ask you like, I don't know, what do they all have um, in common? Like, how do you um, jump from these different projects to different projects? Um, they seem like they take a lot of different skill sets. Yeah, I think the thread that probably connects all of them is it is usually centered around an event. So a lot of times uh, it'll be like a conference or a festival, uh, some type of gathering where people are going to be in one space together. And so you almost have like a built-in audience because there's already a couple hundred people participating in this event. Uh, and usually event, you know, event coordinators, event planners really appreciate there being some interactive element, some like gathering point to take a picture or something that people can even participate in as an attendee of the event. So that I think would be the, the sort of common thread through all of them because the themes have been totally different. Uh, but yeah, I'm trying to think. What was the second the second part of your question? Yeah, it was just. I mean, I think um, it's probably a very unique skill set to be able to adapt to each of these different types of projects with different materials and different groups of people. Um, and just um, wondered if you could, uh, you know, speak to some of the the challenges involved in that, or like the excitement of it, like um, what that is like. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I guess. Uh, Sorry, I'm also I'm also getting my partner is upstairs on a conference call. I'm not sure if that's coming in through as background. I think we're used to that lifestyle okay. at this point, so okay. it's all good. I will I will start over with that response then. So uh, yeah, I think that the skill set is, I mean, in my in my head, it's like that's when I'm putting on my project manager hat. That's when I'm like, okay, I have to see the bird's eye view of everything. I have to know what all the components are. I have to know what the project milestones are, and make sure that I'm communicating not everything to everybody, but only the pieces of information that that team or that person needs for their piece of the project. Uh, challenges, I mean, there's so many different moving parts, right? So like a lot of the builds we've done have been participatory with, it's not just a team of people behind the scenes making a thing. There's an element of interactivity with the audience or the attendees of the event. So another project we did was, um, a huge 3D printed sculpture that had, it was made up of all these little bricks, all these little sections. Uh, let's see if I can navigate to that real quick. So this one was for a conference um, and we built a giant sculpture of Rosie the Riveter. I love this one. So she started off as a clay sculpture. This is like a little seven inch tall sculpture in, in Sculpey and then people printed individual sections. We, we 3D scanned the clay sculpture. Um, so we have a digital model and then the digital model goes into the computer and we slice it in a grid. So there's hundreds, in this case, thousands of individual brick pieces that make up this whole sculpture. Uh, and we can talk more about the detail of this project, but in relation to your question, um, this one was something where we had over 700 people contributing parts from around the world. And so we have to figure out, okay, like what is, there's like a call to action because we want people to participate in this thing. And then how, what are the logistics of getting all these parts and sorting all of these parts? And then how do we structure the build on the day of the event? Because we actually assembled this live um, in during the space of the conference. So it wasn't something that was built when you arrived, people actually helped us put it together. So you can see uh, let's see, on the build day, there are, there's all these layers and we're gluing parts together. I'm scrolling through these really fast, sorry. Yeah, no, so, it's so cool. Here we go. So yeah, we were like putting this together with the attendees of the conference. So there's um, a lot of elements of like 
managing this team of, of basically strangers in, in the event and also trying to make it engaging for participants. So yeah, a lot of the builds we've done uh, have an element of this, right? They have an element of people collaborating with us so that the, the attendees or the audience are also have a sense of authorship in the thing that's being created. Yeah, I love how you describe just the project management role overall too. It's um, a position that I've had in my life. And I think it makes you realize that you can be helpful in any situation just by like slowing down and mapping it out and helping people figure out where they fit into it. And like, that is just a great transferable skill. And it makes these kind of projects with 700 people um, a reality. I, I definitely want to dive more into this one. Um, now, I know that you worked with maybe some different um, organizations like the, like, was it We the Builders or the Nation of Makers? Link? So maybe um, um, you could speak to some of the details of this one. Sure. Um, so We the Builders is a group I got involved with also through the makerspace because it's this is where you connect to folks yeah. like that. They're a, a collective of, well, it's it's three of us. It's an artist, it's a web developer, and they founded at a hackathon. And they basically take digital sculptures, whether it's something that is already you know, already in existence or is modeled in, is modeled digitally. And they do this thing where they slice them up to, into sections. And they've created a platform where they can distribute the parts. So basically people can sign up on the We The Builders website and it will assign them a specific part file. Um, so they can download the STL for that part file and they're all coded. They all have like a geographic location inside of the whole sculpture. Uh, and they will print out this file and ship it to one location. A lot of times people print out many of the bricks. And We The Builders has figured out this whole system to kind of like distribute the parts, send the files, collect the files, and then assemble them. So they've done a number of these, these like collaborative sculpture pieces. Uh, and then Nation of Makers is a network of maker spaces. So it's not, uh, the maker spaces that participate are more so like members. They're not necessarily connected, but Nation of Makers is trying to provide resources and support and sort of build a larger community to span that that network that reaches out across the country. So cool. And I, I think there was a lot of um, intentionality in this project. Like we can see here the different like skin tones. Can you speak to some of like um, the mission or how the project came about? And also like as a project manager kind of thing, I'm always curious about what the timeline was like, because it seems like there was a lot of steps. <laughs> Yeah, uh, they're always, you know, there's never enough time. Uh, so the skin tones was, a, to give some context, so Nation of Makers, this was their event. So this is like their first convening where makerspace leaders from around the country, they've been talking to each other online for a couple of years. A lot of them haven't met. And Nation of Makers was like, let's have, a, let's have an event where we can all come together and talk about all different things that are important to the maker community. Uh, and the theme for this whole event for the conference was intentional inclusion. So about being conscious of who is and who isn't at the table, figuring out ways that we can invite more people to the table. Um, and that was really what the all of the sort of panels and, and workshops and things were, were focused on. So when we, we were going to design a project for the event, uh, we thought about making a giant, a giant Rosie the Riveter, like a huge sculpture of Rosie. Um, and I'd already worked on this project with We the Builders in the past, and we're like, how can we adapt this for this conference? Um, and in terms of intentional inclusion, we were thinking about, you know, Rosie the Riveter as a as a pop culture symbol represents like a whole bunch of people, but she as a as a visual, she's just one person. She's just like one woman. Mm -hmm. But we wanted to show that idea that she's more than one person. She is a symbol of all these people that you know came to the manufacturing business during World War II, but also of all the sort of female bodied makers that are making things in the community today. So the idea of the skin tones was a kind of like, how do we indicate that this is made up of lots of people? It's not one, one tone for the whole sculpture. It's not like, okay, her shirt is blue and her you know scarf is red. We made the whole thing so that it looks like it's made up of lots of different people essentially. It's so powerful. As you were scrolling, I saw one of the blocks said Long Island on it, which is where I grew up. And it's amazing oh. what like, one thing can bring to mind for you. As soon as I saw it, I thought about actually the first time I'd went to, I think it was the Washington Monument and you were going up 
this elevator, maybe I'm getting it all wrong and there's no elevator there, but there was some monument and there was like bricks contributed from all over the country. And I remember like seeing the one that was contributed from Long Island. And I think it's really cool how as history evolves, like the idea of making and collaboration on it, like has been there for maybe a long time, but um, the idea of incorporating different skin tones or like who was at the table is maybe what is um, evolving for the better as we go. And I think it's just really cool how you guys are, are a part of history in, uh, in what you're doing here. Oh yeah, I mean, thank you. I think the, the thing that was really cool for me too, I'm, I actually also grew up on Long Island, that's so funny. Oh my gosh, that's gonna be a whole other conversation. I know, that's, that's the whole thing. <laughs> um, yeah, but like seeing all the bricks as they came in and you know, people wrote messages on them, people like dedicated like this one's for my grandmother or you know, this and like wrote stories and people put like, you know, a sticker from their makerspace on it. So there's this whole, there's whole element of, um, there's like this patchwork of like, visually there's a patchwork, but even like inside of the bricks where they're glued together, there's this time capsule. And we tried to like document along the way, all of these different, different pieces, but it's such a richer story because there's like 700 plus people that sent us in parts. And so all of these people have like a stake in this thing that we built together. Oh my gosh. I wish I could have um, been there to experience it, but I'm so excited to see the next ones that you guys um, come up with because I'm sure there will be more um, collaborations like this. Um, so I'm trying to think of what would be the coolest project to go to um, next. Maybe we, you mentioned earlier doing this South by South Lawn project, but I also noticed that you did have a digital fabrication at South by Southwest. Um, so maybe we could talk about that one next. Sure. Uh, let me switch over to that project. Um, trying to remember where everything's located on my website. <laughs> it's a good like um, quiz on your own website. Probably. <laughs> uh, so here's, here's the thing that you're talking about. So just to give some context for South by Southwest is a, it's, I mean, it's really like an institution in Austin, Texas. Uh, I'm not sure how many years the festival has been happening, but it's been around for a while. And it's sort of a convening of uh, art and music and change makers in the tech space and in the nonprofit space, education, like there's all these different branches of South by Southwest. Um, and we were, the tested team was gonna be going to the event, um, like Adam was doing a, a different panel and uh, we wanted to have something that would sort of be embedded in the in the Austin area like during the festival so this isn't like specifically commissioned by South by Southwest this was sort of like our guerrilla like infiltration of of the the festival happening uh and basically it is what you're looking at is a laser cut layered plywood uh puzzle and there's nine pieces so if you you can like individually see there's nine a grid of nine sections and the visuals, like the images in each of the puzzle pieces is dedicated to a different area of making. So there's like one on science, there's one on uh, uh, like building and architecture, there's a piece on music, there is a piece on computer technology, uh, there's one on food. Like we tried to cover kind of all the different areas of making um, and represent like a different tool or an invention or a person that was important in that field. So this is, I took like different patent drawings and photographs and stuff and sort of illustrated uh, digitally in the computer illustrated these different images and then sent them to the laser cutter and laser, you know, laser etched and cut out all these different sections of plywood and then kind of glued them together. Uh, so that's the, the art piece. The interactive element was we turned this into a scavenger hunt. So I individually mailed each of the nine puzzle pieces to a different location in Austin and put together a, like a trivia, solve the, you know, solve the trivia question kind of thing with like a word scramble. And if you solve the question, it would point to the location. So people were like solving the puzzle during the event, finding the location of a piece and then going to get the puzzle piece where it was hidden at a location. And then they all came together and we put the puzzle together during the festival. Oh my gosh. So I love a good scavenger hunt. My friends and I used to do them at the mall growing up because there was yeah. no Long Island memory, but um, I wonder, so how did you guys decide that a scavenger hunt was the right way to do your kind of guerrilla interaction with South by Southwest throughout the same time as it? 
Uh, I think so. South by Southwest is pretty. How do I explain it? It's the, the tickets are expensive. It's it's you have to usually either you're buying the ticket or your organization is buying the ticket. And we wanted a way for just regular people that were in town to participate in the event. So we didn't want it to have to be something where like you had to have your conference badge to get in to go behind the scenes to do this. Like we picked places that in Austin that would be accessible to the public. So like a museum or uh, some guy in Austin has this, I think he calls it the castle of junk. I'm trying to remember. Oh, like he has this huge collection of stuff in a yard and he is just like a, a collector of, of items and uh, yeah, different museums. I'm trying to think of where else we sent pieces. This was a while ago now. I'm trying to remember where we sent pieces, yeah. but it was mostly just the idea of accessibility of people being able to participate in this without necessarily even having to be in Austin. Like you could solve a puzzle, you could solve the riddles anywhere. Um, and then if you were in Austin, you could go find a, a puzzle piece without having to be, be, you know, have admission to the conference essentially. Oh, it's a, such a cool idea. And the pieces are so, um, so special. So thank you for walking us through them. Um, sure. So another one of your collaborations, um, which is I think how I got introduced to you was the Apollo 11 replica. Yeah. Um, and so that was a, a really interesting thing. I'd love for you to, to explain it. Sure. Yeah, that was um, that's the most recent one that I've worked on. And uh, one of our collaborators with that, our, our sort of person that we worked with was the uh, the Smithsonian, not a person, an institution that we worked with was the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, and they are, you know, this huge collection of museums. I think there's 19 different museums, if I remember, uh, throughout DC, uh, Washington DC area. And there's like Museum of Natural, Natural History, there's the Air and Space Museum, there's uh, the American Indian Museum. There's a whole collection of these and they have this enormous, collection of items. I mean, millions and millions of artifacts and objects. Um, and we were connected with a group called the Digitization Program Office. Uh, my friend Meg works there, which is how we got connected. Yes. Through Meg. She's amazing. Um, and the, their office, the primary goal is to, to digitize the, the entirety of the Smithsonian collection. I suppose someday they'll digitize all of it, but they're working to sort of scan and document these artifacts because lots of them are not on display across the 19 museums. There's only like, I wanna say 1% of the collection is actually out where the public can see it and the rest of it is archived in storage. So they scan all of these artifacts. So they'll they'll take, they have like, you should watch Meg's video, Meg's interview to, yes. to like learn about all this technology. But in a nutshell, they use um, a variety of like photogrammetry and LIDAR and laser scanning and stuff to capture these 3D objects. So what you'll end up with is a model that folks can interact with online. So you can put it in uh, augmented reality, you can download the files to 3D print them. Um, and one of the objects that they've scanned in their collection is the hatch this like trapezoidal door from the Apollo 11 command module. So there's a, a 3D model in their collection of, of this door and the anniversary of the Apollo 11 mission was coming up in 2019. It was 50 years since the first moon landing and the Air and Space Museum was having this huge celebration like you know having different speakers come in. They did a projection on the Washington Monument to replicate the Saturn launch. I mean, it was like this phenomenal event for, for people that like aerospace and also really just for everybody that yes. humanity, you know, like this, this amazing feat for humanity. So they asked, tested to come up with an idea for a project to help celebrate this, to help celebrate the event. And they wanted something that'd be sort of live and interactive and people could, could come to see during the event. Um, so we, we took the the scan of the hatch and we decided to recreate it for the museum like make another version of it uh, but the idea was we wanted artists to make the pieces um, instead of just making like a one-to-one -one, like here it looks exactly like the original we commissioned um, a number of different makers I think 45 different makers to replicate a piece of the hardware so 
we worked with an engineer named Andrew Barth, who is this amazing, amazing design, like CAD modeler and engineer. And he took the 3D scan and using like the original engineering drawings, he reverse engineered every piece of the geometry. So like every latch, every gear, every oh like gosh. single thing on the whole hatch, he isolated it and remodeled like the full entirety of it. And so we sent out the files of, of each part to different artists, so like ceramic artists and woodworkers and machinists, and they all recreated their part that they were assigned of the hatch. And then during the 50th anniversary, we collected all those pieces and on stage in front of an audience, we reassembled the hatch <laughs> for people to, to watch and to kind of see the process. Um, and now it's like a completed object that's actually at on display at the Air and Space Museum. Wow. So you mentioned that there was um, different artists who were commissioned and they actually had like different competencies like ceramics versus woodworking. How were those um, artists selected? Was there like a application process or as a group you guys knew? Uh, it was a lot of people that we knew, people that we like, we tried to get a variety of different skill sets and a variety of different people represented. Uh, it was also folks that like we reached out to Nation of Makers to be like, hey, who do you know that that would be be interested in participating in this project that has maybe a unique perspective or a unique skill set that they could that they could bring to the table. Um, so yeah, it was it was mostly a collection of like who, how many different areas of making can we represent um, and different mediums can we represent in this thing. Um, and I think the the idea behind it was sort of like, the, the command module and, and just aerospace technology in general, when you look at it, it's this sort of cold metal object and it looks so, you know, everything's perfectly machined and it's so finely engineered. But this door was like a, an incredible feat of engineering and manufacturing that was a product of hundreds of people and scientists and fabricators and stuff. And you don't get to see the hand of the maker and the hand of the sort of artist in this cold piece of machinery. So we thought that by having individuals create all the parts, like if you can see something is carved out of wood, it's the same shape, but it's carved out of wood. Like it really calls attention to the fact that this was made by human hands. Like this was created by a person with, um, you know, with their own set of ideas and their own set of like skills that they bring to this project. Yeah, I love that. And you mentioned that this was pretty recently. Was this during um, the time of the pandemic or was it before the pandemic? This was before. So 2019, um, we did that. And that was the last collaborative build that I've got to work on um, because obviously the world has been shut down. But yeah, but I think that um, um, like the collaborative space kind of maybe prepared you guys for the pandemic because you knew how to like, um, interact like remotely to get the pieces together to a one location like I, um like if anyone would know how to work well together during this like um isolation time it would be the project managers of <laughs> these kind of collaborations um i would like maybe you could touch on a little bit during the time of covid i think you talked about like um ppe printing collaboration and parts track and like kind of pivoting to meet the needs of the world at this time um in a, in a sort of different but valuable way um, yeah, I, I would love to chat about that. So I think for, for us, that seems to be, there's, there's a lot in the project management and kind of like organization and people space that was activated for the like COVID-19 um, PPE response. So the We the Builders group, obviously like we weren't trying to 3D print sculptures during, during COVID, um, but we uh, were contacted by the makerspace that I used to work at, uh, OpenWorks, and they were trying to spearhead a PPE effort. So at the beginning of the pandemic, when like, you know, supply chains were were kind of shorted, slowed down, um, and there was a shortage of, of uh, face shields for healthcare workers and front, you know, people working on the front lines, uh, OpenWorks was like, hey, we've got all of this facility there's not people using it right now because we're, you know, because we're closed. What can we do to help manufacture, meet the manufacturing need for these items? Um, the reason that it was something that we, the builders got involved in is when 
the face shields were were printed. So they were what they were hoping to do is to get people to print parts at home and for then OpenWorks to cut the plastic pieces and assemble um, assemble this whole face shield. Um, the sort of like, I guess like liability release aspect of it. So they wanted to make sure that everyone who was participating was following certain safety protocol, you know, wearing a mask while they were assembling it, like all of these different things. So they needed to be able to track which people actually made which parts. Like if you're turning in a box of a hundred 3D printed plastic visors, they wanna make sure this person's following all the safety protocols. So they needed to actually um, sort of track each of the parts throughout the system. And so they reached out to We The Builders to be like, hey, we know you have this parts distribution platform. Could we maybe pivot and use that as a way to track our parts through the system. Um, so We The Builders had, had a small role in helping get this um, campaign. It was called Makers Unite. And they manufactured thousands and thousands of face shields, um, which they distributed to, to people in Baltimore and the surrounding area. Um, so We The Builders helped just a little bit to get that platform launched to the, sort of facilitate their manufacturing process. It's That's so cool though that you guys got to contribute at all. I think. Um, platforms like that are so valuable. I work in, like in nonprofits to talk about like, how can we get our data to speak the same language or how can we do this or that? And um, having those common places or processes already that people can learn from, um, it's great when organizations can share those things um, and help each other. Um, so the collaborative work is a big part of what you do. But you also have had some really fun personal projects that I'd like to, to speak with you a bit about. Um, Maybe we can start with like the analog robot with your wood building work. Yeah, let me go back to screen share. Uh, there we go. So, so this is a this is a wooden robot. <laughs> Uh, this was just a, a one-off piece that was commissioned by uh, sort of a restaurant group and they were setting up a new space with kind of almost like a food court, but like with different local businesses. Um, and they wanted a, a place for people to validate their parking <laughs> for the parking garage. So really mundane, you know, kind of something you wouldn't really pay attention to, but they're like, we want to make it fun. We want to make it more eye-catching than just like a computer with a scan gun on it. Um, so it's basically an enclosure. It's a wooden enclosure that's styled to look like a robot. Uh, and I got all of the, the wood pieces. So these are some of the design sketches. Uh, I got all the wood pieces and the metal uh, from this architectural salvage place. So these are like parts from Bethlehem Steel Factory. The wood, this is a pile of the reclaimed wood. It's all from architectural architectural salvage from Baltimore Row Homes. And I just milled it and beneath all this like rusty, crusty exterior is this really gorgeous, um, it's either yellow pine or, or Douglas fir, I think it's yellow pine, but um, this really beautiful wood and I just kind of like oiled it and put some hardware on it. And uh, yeah, so this is, this is the little parking validation robot. I think it makes it so fun. Like people will be like, we're going to go to that restaurant because their parking validation is so exciting. <laughs> and it's like, what? Um, I've had some parking terrors recently where the machines oh, just no. don't work. So this would be like, I wouldn't even care if this didn't work. I think it'd be so fun um, anyways. But you, you mentioned in college, maybe that you had done like properly or you tried a, a few different, um, you practiced a few different skill sets. Did, did you go into this like, or the projects that you've showed us so far, were they all using skills that you had developed in that university time? Or like, um, are you learning these new skills as you go now? Like, what is that like? Um, I honestly, most of what I do now, I've taught myself since college. Uh, I don't, I, I, I sometimes think that I would have served, it would have served me better to do like an industrial design major or some more theater, so like something that would have given me a little bit more of a leg up on those skill sets, but I, yeah, I taught myself most of the woodworking stuff. Um, I mean, I, I learned a lot at maker spaces too. Like I learned um, at different tool libraries and 
took taken different certification classes at maker spaces. So I'm like slowly amassing all of the skills to make the things that I want to make. But mostly I was studying like, you know, traditional painting and drawing. And like, I did a little bit of um, documentary kind of like filmmaking stuff. So yeah, a lot of it is sort of uh, self-taught, very much um, not official, like, you know, I'm not a certified welder or anything like that, but I figure it out. That's amazing. And is it usually because a project has come up that necessitates a new skill or do you have like a list of like bucket list skills? You just keep checking them off. What is that like? Uh, a lot of times the project necessitates a skill and so I'll figure that out. Um, I have a couple like metal is definitely a frontier that I've, I've scratched the surface, but I'm not super like confident in those skills yet. Uh, digital like kind of CAD modeling and stuff is also like I'm very beginner at that, so I'd like to improve on that. Um, and things like um, like mold making, like working with like silicon and all these different mold making materials. Like there's a lot of areas where I'm like, I have a list. Uh, I haven't, usually I wait for a project that that needs that. And then I'm like, okay, this is my chance to, to like have an excuse to really get good at this, but. Yeah, I think that the, the waiting for the project model would work well for me too. I'm pretty much put things off until I have to do them. Um, so it's nice to get that um, increased urgency because something uh, comes onto your plate. I feel like that helps. Um, your other um, area that you've started to, to work in is like instructional and interactive content that kind of equips other people to be maybe makers in a different way than they have before. Um, and I love the book nooks as an example of that. So what made you interested in, uh, in taking that kind of route with your projects? Uh, I think, I mean, I, I do think it's informed by the work that I did in the past with, um, you know, like retail visual communication. Uh, I, I think the way that my, my brain works is like, especially as someone who's teaching myself, right? Like I have a lot of experiences with reading instruction manuals and like following tutorials. And I, I think the way that I see things is to try to like break them down into smaller parts and figure out how to simplify each step. And so it comes sort of naturally for me to think about like, okay, if I were to teach this to somebody else or how do I like to be instructed on how to learn something? Um, so there's, yeah, there's an element of like, again, that like project management kind of organization communication skills, like how do you take what's in your head and represent it to someone else, either visually or using text or using a video, like with a demonstration. And people learn in so many different ways. So it's like, how do you cover all the different methods that people absorb information? Yeah, I think that those skills are so transferable to, I'm taking like a grant writing course right now. And if you have an idea for a project that you want funded, you have to map out from uh, soup to nuts and like A to Z exactly what's happening to get you from one step to the next step. And I think these instruction manuals are doing just that. Um, you also spoke to people learning in different ways. And uh, maybe you could share a bit about how you are incorporating that into your intention with these book nooks. Yeah, so uh, the book nook thing is a, it's a laser cut kit that I designed. It's sort of like a little, it's a little diorama that fits inside of a bookshelf. Um, and it comes, the kit comes flat pack. So it's just sh sheets of plywood and you like pop out the little parts and put them together. Uh, but when I was thinking about how to, to like, it's, it's a product, it's this thing that people can buy and make at home. And I was thinking about the simplest way to tell people how to put it together. So the first part of that was like labeling all the parts. So I figured out that like every part should have, there's the, a code system with like geometric, like there's like a square or a circle or a triangle. And when you arrange the parts, the square on one piece lines up with the square on the other piece. And that's how, you know, those two sides go together. Um, so just like simple graphical communication where it's like, you don't even necessarily need instruction to know that it's like intuitive almost of like, oh, the square goes to the square and the circle goes to the circle. Um, but I also was thinking about the ways that I could show people the electrical wiring. So like, how do you connect everything up? So for that, I decided to do um, just a diagram. So like illustrated uh, a graphic diagram that shows, it's not like in circuit notation or anything. It's just a visual, like you can see it and it looks like what's in front of you. Uh, and I also put together a, a video. So I just did like a assembly video with me talking. That way people are both getting the auditory and also they're seeing the process in front of them. So that paired with like the graphic symbols and the, um, 
the wiring diagram, like there's all these different ways that you can figure out how to put this thing together so that it's hopefully it's pretty straightforward. Yeah, you're making me believe that I could do it too. So I'm going to have to get on the, the <laughs> site and place my order. Um, and I, I kind of even, I want to step back and ask like, why Book Nook? So for people who are not familiar with them, I don't know, I would describe it as like a little world that sits on your shelf, basically, that you peep inside. But how did you decide that that was going to be what you made kits for? Uh, it was just something I thought was really cool. I've been really into miniatures since I was, since I was little. I just like small stuff and it it's partly like you know there's an element of like oh it's so cute it's so little uh but i think it's also this idea of like being able to escape to a to a, another world like to live in this other fantasy and so having this miniature space it's almost it's immersive in a way because you can kind of like put your face up to it and it's like this whole you know it's not just like looking at one object or one prop like there's an entire space and sort of like imaginary world created around it so yeah, I think they just, they, they started to get popular online and I was like, those are so cool. I could totally make one. Um, and Tested was really into it. So I can show a couple of um, yeah pictures of it. Uh, so let me navigate back to that. So here's, here's me with one of the book nooks and that's what it looks like on the bookshelf. So, so this cool. this particular one is a sort of a Chronicles of Narnia themed with like the lampposts and the coat closet. Um, and it's small. I mean, it's like, you know, these are regular size books. So it's, it's only about 12 or 13 inches high. And you open these little doors and then there's a layered sort of scene um, with lights embedded and, and uh, yeah. No, it's amazing um, and so fun. Um... And if people want to to buy these, Jen, do they go to your you have an Etsy page? Is that right? I do, yeah. Um, right now, I don't have the physical kits available, but I have the laser cut files. So folks can download the files and cut cut the pieces and you can follow the instructions to put it all together. Um, mm -hmm. It's on, uh, I believe it's my Etsy shop is uh, just Jen Schachter. If you search, search my name on Etsy, you'll find my shop on there. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and Jen, I mean, I feel like time has flown. I've loved learning about all your different projects, and I think they're so um, they're so exciting to me. They're so um, inspiring to make me think that I too could be a maker, that any of us could um, could lean into that space and that collaboration. Um, but I'd love to ask you um, as we're starting to wrap up, like, why does making um, matter, and what continues to inspire and motivate you to be in in this world of makers? Uh it's hard for me to imagine a life where I'm not making stuff. It's such a, it's like my way of expressing myself in the world. It's, it's almost like it's a, it's another part of my vocabulary is this like visual tactile thing. Um, I mean, I think for why it's important is, is it gives you agency to alter and augment your own environment. Like if there's something that doesn't exist in the world or like in the case of PPE isn't existing fast enough, like, you have the capacity to create those things. You have the capacity to take apart a thing that you own and fix it or change it or make it serve you better. Um, and environments like visual environments affect people's moods at, you know, like in, in art therapy, like all of these things in our world, whether they're a utilitarian object or they're just like a fun costume that doesn't necessarily serve a purpose other than it's fun. Um, these things all affect us in very tangible ways. And I think having the, the skill set to be able to, to, to manipulate the world, the matter around you is just such a fulfilling skill and a useful skill to have. Yes, I feel like it's also a very empowering mindset. I think maybe a lot of people in our generation are um, doing jobs that are online and maybe they're not even leaving their houses anymore um, because we're in a different world than we were in even a year ago. Um, and I think even if you're not going to be a full-time maker, like to have a part of you that like knows how to tinker or is not scared to tinker is just like, I think that'd be so um, so wonderful to to embrace and to learn how to be comfortable with it or, or trusting yourself or willing to to learn um, so many good good things happening in that world. Um, yeah. Yes. And then I, I'd like to ask you too, more specifically, like what um, do you what have any advice to people who are trying to learn more, or trying to 
be more comfortable with making? Yeah. Uh, I mean, the first thing I would say is there are so many amazing resources. Like we live in such a fantastic time to, to learn things and to be, to be a maker. Um, obviously there's tons of like tutorial videos and stuff on YouTube, like any, any possible thing you could want to learn how to make or fix or take apart. There's almost certainly a YouTube video about it. Um, I also think maker spaces are a fantastic resource. Um, they're certainly not everywhere, but there, there's a lot of them. There's so many around the country. So um, if you're interested in any particular skill set, there's a good chance that there's a space in your community that offers some kind of classes or at the very least has a community of people that will have the same mindset that want to learn those things. So I would say to look for some local maker space, a local tool library um, and plug in because you'll meet you'll meet people like through the classes, but also just by being adjacent to that community. There's just like so much there's such a wealth of like enthusiasm and sharing and giving that exists there. So, yeah, yes, I feel so encouraged by that. I'm excited to do my Google searching um, when we stop, um, stop this conversation. Um, and then finally, Jen, what do you want people to leave knowing about you and about your work and what are you looking forward to right now? Ooh, um, knowing about my work, I, yeah, I guess, I don't know. I, I wear so many different hats and my work spans such a variety of different things. I guess like I I hope that most of the projects that I work on bring some sense of joy to, to people. Like I think a lot of the stuff I work on is either like a fun silly costume or it's like a thing a lot of people can participate in. Um, I want people to feel engaged with the work but also just kind of like I don't know there's a sense for me at least and a lot of things I create of the sort of like childhood wonder of just like oh remember Carbon San Diego or like ET or look at this cool thing that we built together there's kind of that like oh like I hope that that's what comes across so I I'm eager to connect with people in that way like whether it's through a project collaboration or just like sharing things that we're similarly interested in um and yeah I guess I'm trying to remember the second part. Yeah, what are you uh, looking forward to right now? Oh, what I'm looking forward to. Um, I mean, I guess like as, as the world opens back up, I am definitely looking forward to more community build projects, like doing more things like e project egress or like the We the Rosies project. Uh, also, I'm in the process of kind of developing more of my own gen business stuff. So like, I hope there'll be more book nooks. I have lots of ideas for new sort of like kit things that I can create the parts for and then send people so they can like build it and customize it. I really love the idea of just like giving someone the pieces to then create something and then build off of that. So there'll definitely be more of those that I'm, there's, there's a lot, there's the gears are turning for that. So. Oh, the world needs more of it. And I'm so excited to be um, keeping track of your journey and we'll include your website so that other people can do the same and stay posted um, on all of these Cool projects that are going to be coming up. But thank you so much for sharing and connecting with people on this platform, Jen. It's been um, such a privilege for me, and I so appreciate you taking the time. Thank you so much for having me. This is a fun, a fun conversation. I appreciate it.